Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Dave Soika, filling in for Catherine Doe. I appreciate her handling me the hosting duties today and for welcoming all of you to our first episode from the Risk Advisory Group here at Equifax. Collectively, this team supports our U.S. sales teams by providing insights and guidance on how Equifax can help our clients navigate economic uncertainty and uncover hidden opportunities. I support our fintech and inside sales teams, and my panel of experts today include Tom O'Neill, Maria Turbe, Jesse Harden, and Thomas Aliff. Today, we're talking about federal student loan repayment and what it means for your business. But before we begin, let's kick things off with a quick economic update from David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. David? Thank you. The U.S. economy has faced various challenges over the past year, including supply and demand shocks, but it has remained resilient. One warning sign recently, though, is the Conference Board's Leading Economic Index, Uh, which has declined. Uh, It slipped in June and has declined for 15 consecutive months. However, this decline can be explained by weakness in manufacturing and consumer expectations, and it does not necessarily indicate an immediate recession. Consumer spending has been supported by a robust labor market and high wage growth, although factors such as cooling inflation and high interest rates are weighing on sentiment. Rising interest rates have also affected manufacturing, leading to a decline in demand for goods. Housing has been impacted by affordability concerns and high mortgage rates, resulting in a slowdown in residential construction. On the positive side, though, the labor market does continue to add jobs. And in fact, in June, non-farm payroll jobs were added in all census divisions except for New England. And the unemployment rate remains low, which is another positive indicator for the economy. You know, we've also been examining the Supreme Court's decision to halt the uh, Biden administration's plan for student loan forgiveness. The impact on the national economy is expected to be limited because, and that's because the bulk of student loans are concentrated among certain populations. The burden of student loan debt in the United States has significantly impacted young and middle-aged adults, hindering their ability to accumulate wealth compared to previous generations. Although the merits of a large-scale loan forgiveness are still up for debate, it is evident that the Biden administration's plans to cancel up to $20,000 in federal student loans for borrowers earning less than $125,000 a year would have provided some relief to borrowers. However, it is essential to note that the relief could have marginally increased demand and potentially contributed to inflation, which obviously what might not be good at the moment. Student loans primarily affect young people with approximately half of all student debt owned by individuals in their 20s and 30s and around one-tenth owned by those just entering college. Nevertheless, older Americans are increasingly burdened by student loan debt. Approximately one-third of student loans are owned by individuals in their late 30s and 40s and there is growing trend of baby boomers and their parents taking out loans to support their children and grandchildren. Unfortunately, several hundred thousand retired Americans have their social security and other government support payments garnished to repay defaulted loans before the pandemic. Uh, And additionally, minority groups bear a disproportionate burden of student loan debt with nearly 80% of African-American students needing to take out loans for college Uh, education compared to less than 60% of white students. Uh, Furthermore, uh, many African Americans pursue uh, higher education at for-profit colleges, where less than half of all attendees graduate. Consequently, many African Americans accumulate debt with little hope of repayment. The Supreme Court recently halted the administration's initial proposal leaving more than 40 million Americans with student loan debt uncertain about what the future will be for that debt. While this is unlikely to have a substantial macroeconomic impact, uh, we should also be cautious that there can be a larger impact in certain regions, such as the Southeast, uh, where uh, there is a a a fairly large amount of student loan debt relative to income. Thank you. Thanks, David. As you know, federal student loans have been in accommodation status since March of 2020. 
Since then, we've seen government stimulus provide all consumers with additional income for savings and debt reduction. But that money has run out for many consumers. And with the rise of inflation over the last year and a half, much of that excess savings is gone. As a result, we're seeing delinquencies on the rise. However, many loan types are still well below historic highs, while other products like auto have surpassed those highs. So in this time of economic uncertainty, with federal student loan accommodations over and repayment starting back up on October 1st, what's next? Tom, as the risk advisor for our MidFi and credit union clients, why is this important to them? Uh, well, the primary reason is the obvious. I mean, we're in a very unique situation where there's an economic event where literally overnight, yet a vast number of consumers are going to have hundreds of dollars in monthly debt payments that they're going to have to make that they haven't been making for years now. So that's obviously going to create a lot of additional stress in paying their other obligations. And I also want to point out that you know, this is not dependent upon any actions that the administration is doing or the courts are ruling or anything like that. This is a, a cease of those accommodations. Those, that debt that, that's been there for years, they now have to make payments on this. So regardless of what actions are or are not taken, this is a stress that's going to hit you know, many consumers literally overnight. Maria, from a StratFi perspective, why should your clients care? Um, Dave, you, you mentioned this is the, you know, affects over 40 million consumers that have a student, a federal student loan. And so these consumers are in your books. In the case of the strategic finance vertical, it represents anywhere from 15 to 24 percent of the consumer base. So although they are not as evidently affected currently, they are facing these payments resuming in October. Some of these segments are already struggling with rising delinquencies. And so having the extra payment and extra commitments, on average, they have three to four student loans, will stress them out. And it's a concern. Jesse, from an, an ICE perspective, why, why is this important to your customers? Yeah, thanks, Dave. You know, for, for telco and, and energy and insurance customers in general, when thinking about where customers are right now, the customers have had challenges with uh, with inflation. We all know what the inflation impact is. Where you know customers have had to spend more of their disposable income on on regular goods and services, just like uh, Maria and Tom had mentioned. And so we're going to see that you know this problem specifically. It's unique, I think, in the broadness of the of the impact. It's not just a specific age group or a, a specific demographic or a specific type of customer that holds a certain uh, credit. Uh, product. This is pervasive. And so I think we're going to see, you know, broad exposure, not just uh, again in, you know, cert certain age groups, but it's going to hit lots of the portfolio. The other thing I think to think about, which is somewhat interesting, is there's a whole subset of customer base that has never made a student loan payment. So when you think of students that had started in the pandemic and, and post pandemic, they don't have that that cadence of making the, the student loan payment. And so working that into their daily routine is going to certainly be a challenge. And I think that's one of the things that we'll want to you know watch as we as we monitor these types of portfolios moving forward. So as we started off, you know, what we're observing in the auto space, as, as we were describing earlier, is increases in the delinquency rates. Uh, you know, auto is uh, you know, fairly unique from an asset class in a lending perspective in that it is a fairly competitive market. And oftentimes the deal structure is done in such a way where the, the dollar weighted balance delinquencies are oftentimes far lower than that of the incident. So it's, it's a very risk savvy, risk based pricing approach that's, uh, that's often taken in this space. And given that we are seeing the rise and delinquencies, it does cause some potential concern in that space. And we know that the real disposable income is continuing to, to be at risk and, and, and declining. Interest rates being on the rise where they are, there's not a lot of, as much opportunity for refinance in this space. And so for all the reasons that we described, if a student loan ends up going into uh, missed payment, you know, we do expect many consumers that, you know, that if they do end up missing those payments, that will impact, you know, from a downstream perspective, their uh, potential availability of credit and credit card, you know, lowering, you know, some of the 
you know, credit line assignments that could exist if they're if those are driven by you know score categories as well as DTI, you know, type of you know calculations from a, from an ability to pay perspective. And so, oftentimes, what we're trying to think about in this space is you know if, if vehicle values are are holding, disposable incomes down, you know, and and all of this peripheral risk uh, you know continues to rise. Will we expect uh, you know the the rise in delinquencies to occur at a broader base perspective in addition to the rise that we've already seen within subprime? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, from my from the fintech perspective, and right, even from you know the inside sales teams, you know, many of those consumers potentially have cash flows, and you know, the fintechs are serving down market from a credit perspective, and so you know, the stimulus and accommodations have really benefited those consumers, right? That they've been paying down those those debts, and you know, much like we've heard you know across the the spectrum of our customers, is you know, scores have been on the rise, and so while they were able to pay down their debts and raise their scores. Unfortunately, many of them took on additional debt. I think as, as we've all been discussing, you know, with our, our customers. And so what does that mean? And so, you know, as these consumers now face an additional payment, and I think Maria, you know, you've been, you know, at the forefront of this in, in talking with the, with your, your Stratify teams about, around an additional $244 on a monthly basis, that's going to be troublesome for some, some of our, our, our consumers. So, and we think about it from a, a hierarchy perspective, you know, how do we think this is going to play out, right? The, the consumer is going to have their checkbook, they, they're looking at which bills to pay, you know, and how is that going to impact other, other portfolios delinquencies? So, Maria, I'll start with you. Do we think the restarting of, this, of the repayment with this additional two hundred forty-four dollar on average payment, do you think we think that'll contribute to rising delinquency in other portfolios? Thank you, Dave. First, as you were mentioning, the two forty-four dollars uh, expected per consumer uh, from our research from last our study published last year. I'm hearing even higher amounts. I'm hearing a hundred to two hundred per student loan, and again, on average, we have anywhere from three to four. So, so even these amounts, of course, uh, might be on the low side. Um, and in terms of what type of impact will this have on the delinquency of other products, it will depend. There's a very small, of course, extreme uh, percent, three point five percent of consumers that had not been expected to make payments during these over three years, and were still making payments. Right, so they've been used to continuing with with their the typical balancing of of their debt commitments. On the other extreme, and Jesse referred to this, the younger segments, the thinner files that have been granted some breathing room over. Over, over three years and have potentially extended their credit opportunities and acquired a credit card or even an auto loan, now we'll need to juggle uh, additional payments. Again, our conservative amount per consumer is 244. We're, we're hearing even higher amounts. So if they're already struggling meeting these payments, they're, they're faced with higher consumer uh, goods and household expenses. Having that additional amount coming into play will mean they're going to be stressed in, in trying to meet their payments. We, we know from our historic experience, the payment hierarchy of student loans is relegated to the bottom. Nevertheless, it is a concern that they will need to juggle all of these debts, and it might affect, of course, even their possibility going forward in terms of credit possibilities. Jesse, to you. Yeah, I'm glad Maria mentioned the payment hierarchy. You know, we've seen in data uh, with telco specifically that telco is is fairly high up in the payment hierarchy, and I think that that notion is you know is is pretty evident in the in the industry. You know, I do think we will see delinquencies spike within certain segments of the population as a result of the student loan restart. And that's just natural. I think we were at about a four and a half percent delinquency rate pre-pandemic, which is one of the one of the higher groups when comparing to other verticals. So I do think that, you know, we're going to see a delinquency spike. I don't think it's anything that we necessarily have to panic on. Um, and I know we'll talk about some of the the ways to you know, to moderate moving forward. But one of the things to think about too, and, and I guess if I put my economic glass half full hat on, um, you know, we were at 9% inflation last year. Uh, we're, you know, we're coming down from that both with core and, um, you know, core inflation and, and headline inflation. And so the good thing is that the consumer is going to get a reprieve on prices. However, I do think that, you know, as Maria mentioned and everybody else has mentioned, there's a, 
um, there's a big challenge with a 200 to $300 a month more payment, you know, especially in light of uh, debt that's been taken on. There was a study by the University of Chicago in which they looked at what happened when consumers uh, were in this payment moratorium. And lo and behold, you know, they took out more debt. And so we know that customers are, are, are consumers are, you know, specifically going to be in a situation where they have to, you know, start to figure out, okay, what do I make a payment on if I'm constrained? And so that's obviously a concern that I think will translate into into higher delinquency rates and, and something that definitely I think every portfolio is going to need to watch. Thomas, what are your thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah. So I think the, you know, the big question that I'd like to ask on this is, would you have underwritten that loan today, given the change in terms from origination to uh, an account management perspective to see, would you have changed the, you know, that deal? And, and, you know, the deal, you know, structure will incorporate things like loan to value, credit score, the debt to income and payment to income as is oftentimes, you know, the key drivers behind that. And so for looking at the, you know, the, I guess the interaction of each of these terms, it, you know, knowing that you know vehicle loans, uh, you know, we're up three thousand dollars on average. Uh, we know we're maximized sixteen percent of the population. You know, has a thousand dollar payment, which is actually lower risk given the the pricing structure that we do in auto. It's uh, quite a you know that, that's another myth that we've dispelled you know this year. But it, you know, as as you consider that you know that overall impact from like a you know a loan to value, debt to income, payment to income, and potential score decrease, that's where I would we would you know see where th- this could occur. And and also it's great to. See Size the the population to know of those loans that you know consumers have from uh, from an auto perspective. How many have a student loan? And we know on average it's about sixteen ish percent. But as you break that down, there's going to be different populations that that may have more or less. So sizing it is going to be the most important aspect, and then putting that up against you know how we did underwriting from uh, from an origination perspective. Awesome point. I like that. Thinking about would you make the same loan today? Would you make the same decision? And more times than not, you will. And so that's or it's I have a hundred of those those and it's one problem and so would i still like to underwrite the other 99 so great great point to think about tom your thoughts on this yeah well i'm i'm thinking since uh jesse took the class half empty you know role i'll, I'll do a bit of role reversal uh, and, and be the downer on this but he rightfully pointed out that you know we are seeing inflation cool we're we're in a better spot from from in certain circumstances uh, to take that because because of those yeah, falling prices and, and a little more breathing room from a, a consumer spending side. But I'd, I'd counter that by saying we're also coming to this at a point where a lot of that savings that had been built up in the early years of the pandemic, they're gone for a lot of the consumer base. So these these payments are, are coming up when a lot of folks don't have the savings and the the, the bandwidth to really take this additional burden on. So that is something that uh, that could be an impact as we go into it. And, and one other piece that I find very interesting, and it's, it's unfortunately something that we can't really put numbers to, is that there is an emotional aspect to this for, for many of these uh, student loan holders. You know, for, for many of them, in their, in their eyes, the debt was forgiven. You know, they, they were granted this reprieve and, and, and these payments went away. And, and, and to some, even though it's not a logical, rational you know, reaction, for some, the, the resurfacing of these payments carries with it a very negative emotional aspect to it. And, and so when we talk about payment hierarchies and, this, and how this, this is going to impact prioritizing you know, payments on my card or my auto loan or things like this, there is, there is a random element to this, and that's the emotional aspect, which a lot of people are going to be looking at it as, you know, as they should, you know, in a financially, you know, fiscally responsible way. But others are going to you know, carry with it some of that, that emotional attachment to, you know, to this thing, which rightly or wrongly, they, they thought, oh, I don't have to worry about this anymore. And now it's, it, now it's hitting them. So again, not something that we can really quantify until we actually see it and, and, and we, we experience it and we see how people are reacting. But it, it adds a little static to the whole equation here. Hey, Dave, if I might, I do want to call out. I think this may be the first time I've ever been called the glass half full guy. So, I, I, you know, well, I, I do want to call that out. Because I, I usually go through with rose-colored glasses. So, uh, well, I did, I did want to say 
Well, one other thing I think, and it's it's a good point that Tom made when we think about the the payment programs and some of the the things that are happening in you know in the political circles. You know, we don't know what that impact is going to be, and I think it's important that the point that Thomas made when we talked about how you know how you look at your decision and, and what that decision would have been, you know, kind of pre and post. Uh, certainly, thinking of uh, when a consumer is is faced with that noise, let's call it noise in the in the market, whether it's the political pundits talking or whether it's the the courts talking. We, we don't really know how that's going to impact their decision making process to make that payment. You know, maybe they decide, hey, there's all these, you know, forgiveness plans that are out there. I'm going to qualify for one of them. So let's not worry about this, you know. And so that's, I think, an intangible that I wouldn't necessarily put that as something we need to closely follow because it's, I mean, honestly, you could spend your whole career following that, knowing how, you know, how the courts work. But certainly it's something that I think is is good to understand because we're not, we're in a different situation now, you know, talking about loan forgiveness, you know, that typically has a consequence on a consumer in this situation. You know, there's a lot of discussion about uh, forgiveness of loans where there is no consequence. And so I think that could have a different impact on, on the, the way customers interact, you know, or consumers interact. So that's just something to kind of think about as well. Yeah. You know, this, kind of pulling that thread on the emotional piece, right? I mean, if you think about it, right, those those consumers are sitting there and they've got a suit loan payment due and they think about, well, is it going to get me to work? Is it going to keep my internet working? Is it going to keep my cell phone on? Is it going to give me a roof over my head? The answer is no, right? So that that knee-jerk reaction from the consumer might be it's a sunk cost. It's, I, I have no value. Today, it gave me, that maybe got me my career, but I'm not, you know, it doesn't give me value at, at this particular moment. So, right, I think that emotional impact will be there, right? And that's, again, it doesn't impact our clients directly because, again, most of them are not student, federal student loan lenders. But what it's going to impact is their scores, right? And and their capacity to pay. So while they might choose, the students, you know, might choose to default, that's not going to impact the car. It's not going to impact the card. But it might be downstream when that credit line is up for for increase, decrease decision and their score has dropped 20 to 30 points because they've been missing payments. So I think that's the piece to think about, you know, trying to rewrite your decisions from, you know, from a year or two ago is not going to accomplish anything from a lending perspective. It is you've made the decision. You kind of have to live with it. And how do you how do you mitigate that? How do you go forward with it? And that's kind of the next the next piece of this. Right. Jesse is I'll throw this to you. So. We've talked about the, there's 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 repayment restarting. We've talked about the we've quantified the size of it and what the impact is. So, how do our clients assess it, the impact, and how do they address it from a risk perspective on their books? Yeah, so uh, that's the the million dollar question, right? And I would say that you know I'm. I'm from Texas. We have big storms. The saying is always, don't be scared, but be prepared. And I think that kind of applies here. It's, you know, it's not something that we have to to be scared about. Fortunately, there is some time in the decision where, you know, payments are, you know, are not going to start to, you know, to happen for at least another month or two. So I think the biggest thing that customers can start with is they can start with knowledge, you know, and so, better understanding in my portfolio, uh, you know, how many customers is this going to impact? What are the sizes of the balances that are, you know, that are on the on the books for these student loans? And really just getting a better understanding of, of who these customers are going to impact, or I'm sorry, who these, um, you know, which ones of these consumers are going to be impacted. And then I would say, you know, from there, I think the, you know, the, the approach could be that idea of crawl, walk and run. So we know who's impacted. You know, now let's figure out how we get data on those who are impacted so that we can better understand, you know, the velocity. So, you know, are we seeing changes in payments? Are we seeing changes in debt to income that would lead to that pressure that we know those consumers are going to face? And then I think you can get more sophisticated as you have that knowledge in terms of understanding, you know, real time. Who are those customers that are impacted? Can we see the real time nature of, of those impacts? And then we're not just talking about a, you know, a, a, a risk type approach. You know, you could have, and, and I was thinking about this with my vertical as well. You could have customers 
you know, that maybe it's an opportunity to try and market a different type of product to them. If we know that there's, and again, I'm, I, I like hats, right? So I'm going to put on a different hat here, maybe put on my marketing hat. But, you know, if there is an opportunity perhaps to get a, a different type of product or a different type of uh, utility of a product in for that customer, knowing that they're going to have maybe more challenges in their in their life with, with the payment structure of the debt that they have. Uh, maybe that's an opportunity to reach out, you know, to reach out to that customer and say, hey, you know, here's a product that maybe fits closer to to the, the situation that you're in. So I think that outreach, I think looking at the the impact and, and you know, who is it going to impact in my portfolio and then really building those plans of, of outreach. I think that's where I would start. No, I'm sure your thoughts on that. Yeah, so we've talked a couple times, you know, a few few different perspectives, whether the glass is half full, whether it's half dem- empty. It's always going to have on the other side some form of air, whether it's cold or hot. And so what I'd like to, you know, to propose as a part of this is really understand and assess the, you know, the total market, size it. You can't make a decision or remove uncertainty without data, and there's so much data available, and to have that data updated at the most frequent levels, you know, we put out studies that movement from if, if there's no account review done, do account review. And if and once you start doing an account review, move that as frequent as you can up into a up, up into the status of you know quarterly to monthly. Monthly is what we highly recommend for pretty much every portfolio and get all the key statistics that are associated with the underwriting. You know, when we we talked about what what could be the potential rise in delinquency is would you have underwritten that loan today in the same way you did uh, originally? Get those same stats. Look at it uh, from a month over month basis and look at the migration that the consumers would have and uh, you know have access to that information as quickly as possible. So if you're not you know, leveraging things like updates and employment and income, debt to income, payment to income, you know, loans of value, vehicle prices, and have quick access to that through things like some form of cloud delivery to be able to take that information and also action on it quickly from you know, delinquency reduction, collections, you know, any form of behavioral strategies, you know, and, and then ultimately being able to, to update your, your forecasts. Yeah, well, Jesse and Tom have both you know, done a great job you know, outlining you know, the fundamental aspect of just knowing what's going on there. You know, who on, on your portfolio is is susceptible and what's going on with them and, and how are they behaving outside of your, your purview. But there, there's always that next step. You know, you have the knowledge, you, you can build up that awareness, you can do the you know, the more frequent you know, account review cadence, as Tom, Thomas mentioned. But then what do you do with that knowledge? And and I think a lot of people in, in situations like this where you know, it's, it's a risk event, it's something where you know, the, the automatic reaction is sort of a, a knee-jerk tightening up, you know, do a line decrease or something to, to minimize exposure as an example. Those types of things are, are there, but I'd, I'd also point out that, that, that it's an opportunity to work proactively with your clients. And this is particularly true with the, the credit union space and their memberships where, you know, the the onus is on reaching out to them and saying, hey, we, we understand you're in this new situation. There is this additional financial stress. You've got less capacity. What can we do to work together, you know, whether it's loan consolidation, payment plans, uh, financial awareness, whatever the case may be, to, to help their membership or help their client base get through this period and this this essential shock to the system. And, and so it's an opportunity from that standpoint and not just a, you know, a, a risk entrenchment you know, type activity. Maria. Thank you. To, to recap, exactly the awareness component in the strategic finance uh, vertical is critical. And I would, I would add the speed as we were uh, talking about the neighbors, everyone is, is affected to some degree. So if you are going to be proactively assessing your portfolio at the overall level, you are frequently on a monthly basis, ideally assessing the impact of the student loan coming into play or, or other aspects, right? Of, of the, the debt that your consumers hold and how they're juggling their commitments. Being able to get there first proactively is, 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 it would be a big advantage. And, and on the other hand, I'm also, um, in a way, uh, leveling with what Tom and, and Jesse mentioned. Mentioned, which is the having to do with the emotional aspect and potentially also the age groups. I've heard from uh, my customers um, other type of perspectives in terms of being also careful as to how you approach these proactive campaigns in, in assessing whether it's educational financial programs or changes to, or, or potential new products, as Jesse was mentioning. Depending on the age group, having that information in your customers might be 
considered a little bit intrusive. So you also have to assess in what ways knowing your customers and, and you should be very close to, to, to that type of uh, knowledge is the best way to dis- discern and approach the different options uh, that are most suitable depending on, on the segments that, that you are proactively pursuing. So, Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, before I get into the fintech side of things, I mean, that's the, the key here, right? It's, you know, any any kind of, attribute identification is going to be close or pretty, you know, it's not going to be a hundred percent. And, and while being, while, while having those guardrails from accuracy perspective on a, on a positive perspective, it can have detrimental impact to your customer experience on a negative side, proactively decreasing a line because you think this, this person is a risk without ever talking to them or so on again. And, and it turns out that they don't have that exposure so there, you know, there could be the downside of that. So really understanding the data and, and being loose enough with your with your strategies to to account for minimizing that risk, but also not shooting yourself in the foot, if you will, by by going too far. You know, in terms of the fintech group, obviously there's some I've heard from some customers refi opportunities. Right? There are customers who who do student loans that have opportunities to refi those consolidations can you give out a personal loan for you know with the lines so really i mean the interest rate where it's at kind of constrains some of those opportunities but knowing that you know you have those opportunities to potentially gain new customers that might be in trouble depending on the balance size and what you what you allow for a question was posed might consumers tap into you know their, the equity in their homes with a heloc to pay off their loans that, that might be an opportunity as well. So those lenders that are looking for that, I mean, again, it really depends on the risk profile that, you, that you're serving. But again, these are other opportunities. And then you know, on the downside, again, your collection strategies, right? Are you able to, to assess these people you know, downstream if they do go bad with you in terms of how you can mitigate your, your recovery on these consumers? And ultimately, it's you know, all these things are great, but if your credit policy doesn't allow for you to take any kind of action, I think that's another piece that you need to think about. You know, it ties, ties back to Thomas's com, you know, comment about would you re-underwrite this loan, right? The criteria, your guidance, what does your credit policy allow you to do from a re-age perspective? Skip a payment, you know, line, you know, line, you know, line freeze, whatever it is, make sure that you have all that set up before you go in and, and try to address these, these higher risk consumers or Again, look for opportunities on the on the lower risk side. So I think that takes us to the end of our discussion. I want to thank you all for participating. And for you, audience, thank you for joining us today. For those, for our listeners that would like to know more about this topic, please reach out to us at riskadvisors at equifax.com or reach out to your Equifax sales contact for more information. Thank you. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.